Hey there crew, today I'm going to read to you one of the most amazing books I've ever read called So Tall Within, Sojourner Truth's Long Walk Toward Freedom. So Sojourner Truth is an icon and symbol for uh, freedom and women's rights, slave rights, all people's rights and freedoms. She fought for them all and her story is inspiring but so are the amazing illustrations in this book. They are just so rich and powerful just as her life and words were rich and powerful. So, here is the story. Let's get started. So Tall Within. In slavery time, when hope was a seed waiting to be planted, Isabella lived in a cellar where the windows never let the sun in and the floorboards never kept the water out. She had ten or twelve brothers and sisters, but she couldn't be sure since almost all of them were sold as slaves before she was old enough to remember. So, this is unthinkable, unimaginable, horrifying, really. Can you imagine not knowing how many brothers and sisters you have or knowing them at all because of slavery tearing them apart? But Mama Beth, her mother, kept them in memory. Sometimes at night she held Isabella and pointed to the skies over New York State. Those are the same stars and that is the same moon that look down upon your brothers and sisters she whispered and isabella looked at those same stars that same moon and dreamed when isabella was about nine years old she was sold for a hundred dollars along with a flock of sheep mama bet held her one last time they would always remember to look at the same stars that same moon even though they would be ever so far away from each other and every night after that isabella kept her eyes wide open so, age nine, sold for $100 along with sheep to never see her mother again. Tragedy. That's what slavery was. In slavery time, when happiness was a dream never coming true, Isabella was put to work. Now the war begun, she thought. First she worked for Mr. Neely, who figured she didn't need shoes in the wintertime. Two years later, she worked for Mr. Shriver, who had her carry fish and hoe corn and dig roots and tend herbs and tote gallons of dark molasses. A year and a half after that, she worked for Mr. Dumas, who, dragged, or who bragged that Isabella could do a good family's washing in the night and be ready in the morning to go into the field. And she did, night after night, day after day, night after night, day after day. Is that fair? Is that right? Absolutely not. But sometimes she looked up at those stars and that moon and she asked God if he thought it was right either. In slavery time when respect fell as often as snow in July, which is not often at all, Mr. Dumas ordered Isabella to marry a slave named Thomas and she had five children, James, who died in infancy, Diana, Peter, Elizabeth, and Sophia. So the five children and one passed away as a baby. At night, under the light of those stars and that moon, she wondered if her children and her children's children would always be slaves too. Would things ever change and be better? In slavery time, when promises were thin as old smoke, Mr. Dumas swore that if she would do well, he would free Isabella and give her a log cabin to live in by next summer, a year before all the slaves in New York State had to be freed by law anyway. But the summer came and the summer passed. Oh, thought Isabella, I have felt as if I could not live. So that fall, after the work of the harvest was done, she held her baby Sophia close and seized freedom with her own hands. She ran off. Along the road, she came to the house of Isaac and Maria Van Wagner. They welcomed her inside. They promised they would never abandon her. They were there when Mr. Dumont found Isabella. You've run away from me, said Mr. Dumont. No, said Isabella. I walked away by daylight. You must go back, he said. Isabella shook her head. I shall take the child then, said Mr. Dumont. But Isaac and Maria kept their promise. They paid Mr. Dumont's price for all the work Isabella might have done before she was freed by law, and they paid his price for the baby too, and Mr. Dumont left. Was uh, Isabella safe now?
Isabella asked Isaac and Maria if they were her new masters. Isaac shook his head. He was master to no one, he said. And now Isabella was a slave to no one. Could she be free? But in slavery time, broken promises were like leaves on a tree. Mr. Dumont sold Isabella's five-year-old son, Peter, to Mr. Gedney, who sent him down south. Though Isabella could not read or write, she knew that in New York, where they lived, no slave could be sold outside the state's borders. Isabella, on foot and alone, went to the Dumont house and knocked on the door hard. And when it opened, she said, I will have my child. And Mrs. Dumont shook her head. What a fine fuss to make, she said, and closed the door in Isabella's face. So Isabella walked to the Gedney house and knocked on the door and said, I must have my child. Mrs. Gedney told her that Peter had gone to live with her married daughter to have enough of everything and be treated like a gentleman. But Isabella knew this was a lie. My boy is gone as a slave and he's too little to go so far from his mother, she said. Mrs. Gedney closed the door again in her face. But Isabella thought, I felt so tall within. I felt as if the power of a nation was with me. And Isabella traveled miles and miles across New York to Kingston to tell her story to the grand jury. They saw how tall within she was. They gave her a letter for the sheriff demanding that Peter be brought home. She took the letter and walked miles and miles back. Peter was already away in Alabama, but Mr. Gedney read the letter and knew he must obey the court. He went down south to find Peter while Isabella waited and prayed, Oh, God, help me get my son. If you were in trouble as I am and I could help you as you can me, do you think I wouldn't do it? And you can see we the people. Remember that from social studies? After a few months, Isabella held Peter again, but the Alabama masters had whipped Peter, kicked him, and beaten him, and he would never truly heal. That was slavery. In slavery time, when chains tore families apart like the wind frays a flag, Isabella still looked up at those stars and at that moon and hoped her brothers and sisters saw him too. They did. A year after Peter was freed, he and Isabella moved to New York City, where she met a woman named Nancy at the church. When they held hands, Isabella said, the bony hardness was so much like mine. But Nancy passed away. Soon afterwards, she met her sister and then her brother Michael, who had been stolen from her long ago. They told her they'd have another sister in the city, but she had just died. Her name was Nancy. Then Isabella understood that one of the first people she had ever met in New York City was her own sister and didn't even know it. What is this slavery, wondered Isabella, that it can do such dreadful things? So she met Nancy at church, thought, hey, she kind of looks like me. Turns out it was her sister who she had never known because of slavery. Perhaps that was the moment Isabella knew she had a journey to make under those stars and that moon, and it would be a journey, a sojourn, to tell the truth about slavery, and maybe then slavery would end forever. More than 15 years after she walked away from the Dumas, Isabella changed her name to Sojourner Truth, and she began to walk again. So a sojourn is a fancy word for a long journey, and then she took this long journey to tell the truth about slavery, to try to get rights and freedom for all. So she changed her name from Isabella to Sojourner Truth. In slavery time when words seemed weaker than whips, Sojourner Truth left New York City with a bundle of clothing on one arm, a basket of food on the other. She began to speak out against slavery to whoever would listen. Not everyone wanted to hear, but she had the lever of truth, she said. So she spoke. In Massachusetts, she said, what a beautiful world this would be when we should see everything right side up. And in Ohio, she said that she had seen some of her children sold into slavery, and when I cried out with grief, no one heard. In Indiana, she said, the truth is powerful, and I will prevail. Truth will win in the end. In slavery time, when tiredness stood at the doorway, Sojourner Truth walked all the way to Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, and there she met Abraham Lincoln. And she told him he was the best president who has ever taken the seat. In Michigan, where we live, she collected food and clothing for the black regiments of free men and former slaves fighting in the Civil War to end slavery. In Virginia, she worked with the Freedmen's Bureau to teach liberated slaves how to live in freedom. And when some people wanted to stop her, she warned that if they tried, she would rock the United States like a cradle. She wouldn't be stopped. 
In Washington, D.C., when a streetcar conductor would not pull up for her, she cried, I want to ride, so loudly that the carriage traffic around them stopped and she got on. The conductor threatened to throw her off, but she told him that she knew the laws as well as he did, and she stayed on and rode a little longer than she'd planned just to make the most of it. For years and years, Sojourner Truth walked and told her story and fought for freedom, and when slavery time finally ended, she felt so tall within. And in freedom time, when hope kindled a fire in the dark and happiness winked over the horizon, Sojourner Truth told an audience in Massachusetts, Children, I've come here like the rest of you to hear what I have to say. And what she had to say was plenty. She spoke of a woman's right to vote. She spoke about making prisons more humane. She asked the government to offer land to former slaves. She spoke against capital punishment. And for almost 15 more years, she walked thousands of miles to Philadelphia, to Brooklyn, to Washington, D.C., to Kansas and Iowa, Missouri, Wisconsin, Illinois, and all over the state of Michigan. And everywhere she went, she spoke of freedom. And in freedom time, when respect wanted to show its face and broken promises tried to mend, Sojourner Truth walked to Battle Creek, Michigan, where she lived with her free daughters and grandchildren. And Sojourner Truth was weary and ready to lay down her lever of truth. So she lived in Michigan in the end of her life. In freedom time, when chains broke and words got up to sing and tiredness, oh, tiredness, dance to hallelujah, Sojourner Truth asked herself, what is anybody in the world for? She was tired. Then she looked up at those same stars, the same moon, and she saw them shining over everyone, everyone, and she knew what she had been in the world for. I had work to do, she thought. My lost time that I lost being a slave was made up because when she was free she was able to fight for others who couldn't fight for themselves she got freedom the slaves were free and she made a big difference and impact on anyone she came in contact with and my hope and goal is that we can use kindness and respect and freedom uh, to ignite us to make an impact and help those in need as well we can do our part and sojourner truth went above and beyond and i hope that you're inspired by her story and we can remember her as always being a champion uh, for others just as we are champion artists and champions ourselves keep up the good work mis amigos adios